All right, we're going to talk about circular motion. Um, so if I have a circle here, then um, I've got my circle, and I have this little uh, part that's theta here, so this small angle theta. And this is the arc length s. And if theta is really, really small, then s is just about equal to delta x, where delta x is a straight line drawn from those two points. So um, we are looking at circular motion at a constant speed first. So if we think about a constant speed, then um, at this point on the circular motion path, uh, we're traveling with a given velocity. And then at this point, we're traveling at a given velocity. So let's call this v1 and this v2. And we can make a little triangle here showing delta v. So we know that delta v is equal to v2 minus v1. And since these are vectors, we have to add them using our vector rules. So we take v2, and I'm just going to clone this here. Um, okay, so we take v2, and then we subtract v1 by taking v1, <laughs> that's a little bit, and rotating it 180 degrees, and then adding it on the end of v1, and then we get the resultant there, that's v2, is from the beginning of the first to the end of the last, so this is our delta v. Notice that the delta v is pointing towards the center of the circle. So um, that's our direction of our change in velocity. And since acceleration is equal to the change in velocity over the change in time, and time is a scalar, delta v and acceleration share the same direction. So what that tells us is that delta v and a, so change in velocity and acceleration, point in the same direction, and that is towards the center of the circle. And then um, as delta t approaches zero, so we're thinking about very, very small delta thetas, where delta t is very small, v1 and v2 are essentially parallel, and um, acceleration is perpendicular to each one, v1 and v2, again, pointing towards the center of the circle. All right, so um, we're going to derive our equation for what we call centripetal acceleration. So here again, we have r, so this is the radius of the circle, and this is a small delta theta, um, where, sorry, I guess just theta, this is delta x, and then this is our chord, which is way too curvy, but you get the point, uh, and that's our chord s. So we know theta must be in radians for this to work. Theta is so small that delta x is equal to s, just like on the previous page. Now we know this equation from math class, s equals r theta, so the length of the chord uh, is equal to r times theta. And then if we rearrange some things, we get delta x equals r theta. So we're basically plugging that into there and we get delta x equals r theta. So now we're going to apply this to this velocity triangle. Um, this is the same thing I drew on the last page, except it's drawn a little bit <laughs> nicer. Uh, we have this um, arc theta. We show v1 here and v2 here. And then delta theta uh, is pointing towards the center of the circle. And we can see this um, vector addition triangle right here. So we have delta v is equal to v2 minus v1. And remember that delta v and um, 
centripetal acceleration point in the same direction. So this value right here, centripetal A sub C, this is centripetal acceleration. And it is the acceleration that is pointed towards the center of the circle. And what does um, centripetal acceleration cause? It causes turning. Or direction change. I think I'm actually going to put change in direction. Oops. That's the wrong one. Change in direction. So tangential acceleration is going to cause speeding up or slowing down, but centripetal acceleration is going to call, cause um, turning. We also call this radial acceleration. I'll put that right here, aka radial acceleration. Okay, so back to our triangle here. Um, if theta is very small, then delta V equals V theta. Um, and that is the same argument that we had up here with our um, position triangle. And so the arc length is so small that it can be assumed to be a straight line. And um, then we're going to do this. So we know delta x is equal to, <coughs> excuse me, our theta, and v equals delta x over delta t. So we're going to put this into here, and then we get v equals r times theta over delta t. If I rearrange this to solve for delta t, I get delta t is equal to r theta over v. Now, um, on the other side, I know that I have delta v is equal to v times theta, and acceleration is equal to delta v over delta t. So now if I take this t, delta t, and I plug it into there, then I'm going to get acceleration is equal to v theta over r theta over v. So then if we multiply by the reciprocal there, we get acceleration equals v theta times v over r theta. And then we can see that our thetas cancel, and what we are left with is acceleration is equal to v squared over r. So um, this is centripetal acceleration, or radial acceleration. There are two names for it, and you should be able to be familiar with both of them. So that's our equation for centripetal acceleration. Now we can apply this to um, our net force equation. I really should have a net there. So net force equals ma. Um, force, we have, um, so a radial force, which is, uh, mass times radial acceleration. That's the same thing as centripetal force, which is um, mass times centripetal acceleration. There are just two names for it, so I wrote them both up there for you. Uh, sorry, my acceleration vectors aren't all on there, or my vector arrows aren't all on there. Um, and so what I can do is I can plug in my equation for radial acceleration, um, and I get an equation for centripetal force which is mv squared over r. 
and this is a vector, and that's a vector. Um, so this is centripetal force, or radial force. And this is the net force acting toward center of the circle. And it causes a change in direction. Tangential force will cause a speeding up or slowing down. Radial force causes a change in direction. So we have some things, centripetal acceleration and radial acceleration are the same thing, point towards the center of the circle and cause an object to change directions. Tangential acceleration um, points tangent to the motion of the object and causes an object to change speed. And we know that if that acceleration points in the same direction as velocity, it will speed up and opposite direction of velocity, it will slow down. Here's something that you probably already know, but you do need to know it for circular motion. Um, period is the time for one complete revolution. The unit is seconds. And then frequency is the number of cycles per second. So in circular motion, you might have something that goes around the circle twice every second. Then that would be a frequency of two hertz. A hertz is one over second. So it's like number of cycles over seconds, but cycles isn't really a unit, so you just put one over seconds. Uh, they are inversely related, so frequency equals one over period. Let's try an example problem. So here we have a bucket that is being swung around. Um, it says V is constant, and that's 5 meters per second. I don't know why it's cut off so weird. <laughs> uh, mass is 0.5 kilograms. Radius is 1 meter. We need to find the force of tension in the string at the top and the force of tension in the string at the bottom. So let's do the top first. And these problems are going to be just like your other force problems. You start off with a force diagram. So we start off and we um, set our system as the bucket, and we know we have the force of gravity acting down and we have the force of tension acting down. And I'm just going to choose uh, the center of the circle as positive. That works uh, pretty well for most problems. And then I'm going to write my net force equation. So um, the sum of my forces uh, is equal to force of gravity plus force of tension. And I know that instead of, like, just with our last, um, our regular force problems for just two-dimensional two motion, we plugged in for net force MA. We're going to plug in MA, but this time it's radial acceleration. So we plug in MV squared over R. And then for force of gravity, we plug in MG. And then um, for force of tension, we just have force of tension. That's what we're solving for. We can rearrange the equation to solve for force of tension. So I'm going to subtract mg onto the other side. And we get mv squared over r equals mg. Oh, excuse me. I just said subtract, and then I put equals there. I don't know what's up with that. Minus mg. Um, and then we get force of tension equals, I'm going to bring the mass out, so I actually think I might need a little more space to do that. Okay, so force of tension equals 0.5 kilograms times the velocity, which is 5 meters per second. We're going to square that value over the radius, which is 1 meter, minus the gravitational field strength, 9.8 newtons per kilogram. Um, and then when we solve that out, we get force of tension equals 7.5 newtons. That was fun. All right. Now let's do the bottom. So at the bottom now, the bucket's going to be here. We're going to put the bucket in the system. But it's going to look a little bit different. We need to draw a new force diagram. 
So now our force diagram, we're going to have gravity down, but tension is now up. Now in order for the bucket to go in a circle, we have to have a net force upward uh, in order for it to turn towards the center of the circle. So our tension has to be bigger than our force of gravity. And I'm going to choose up as positive. Like I said, usually choosing the center of the circle as positive works pretty well. So now we write our net force equation. So the sum of the forces uh, is equal to the force of tension plus the force of gravity. And those are all vectors. Now, I know that the force of gravity is acting in the opposite direction of the force of tension, so that's actually a negative value. And um, I can rewrite it as um, the sum of the forces is equal to the force of tension minus the force of gravity. So that kind of puts my vector sign out there. Um, and so I know that I'm accounting for my negative sign in my force of gravity uh, with that negative sign. Okay, so then we have mv squared over r that we plug in for our, um, our net force. And then that's equal to force of tension minus mg. So now I solve for force of tension, and I get mv squared over r plus mg. And then um, I can factor out my m. And that's still a vector. And then, oops, I can plug in my numbers. So we get 0.5 kilograms times 5 meters per second, that value is squared, over the radius, which is 1 meter, plus the gravitational field strength, 9.8 newtons per kilogram. And then when I solve that, I get force of tension is equal to 17.5 newtons. Um, and this would be uh, up, and I guess I didn't put a direction on this one, so this would be down. So notice that the force of tension has to be greater um, at the bottom because it has to not only account for the gravity here, it has to balance out the gravity, but then it has to provide an extra net force to cause the acceleration upward. Okay, let's do one more. Um, see, we have a car going around a turn. Let's say that this is a level road. We will do some where the road is slanted. It gets a little more challenging and fun. Uh, and our force of friction is the force that causes the car to go in a circle to make the bend. And that friction is going to act perpendicular to the car's velocity, and it's going to <clears throat> um, act towards the center of the circle. We are also assuming that this is moving at a constant speed. If it wasn't, then um, there would be some net tangential force, which makes things a little bit different as well. So to set this one up, um, you know that your sum of forces in the um, radial direction is equal to the force of friction. And then we replace the sum of forces with mv squared over r. And on the force of friction side, we have mu times the normal force. So since it's level ground, then we're going to have our normal force equal to basically negative force of gravity. But um, force of gravity is a negative value. So um, we end up with our normal force just being positive mg. So then we can plug in um, mv squared over r is equal to mu times mg. And notice that our masses cancel. So ma this problem is not dependent on mass, which is fun. And um, then we would get v squared over r equals mu times g. So if you knew some values, you could solve for things like what's the um, 
how fast can the car go if this is the given coefficient of friction or what's the coefficient of friction required if the car is going a certain speed. So those are just a couple of examples of um, circular motion problems, but remember um, that these are just like your other force problems. It's really not any different. You're going to draw a force diagram, write a net force equation, solve from there. The difference is that you're plugging in mv squared over r because this is a radial net force or centripetal net force. Um, the r or the c works fine. And I'm going to go ahead and put those little r's in here so that we don't forget them. All right.